welcome to the next session of the Psychology of Atlas Shrugged Characters. And uh, we have Andy Bernstein here, who teaches uh, philosophy and literature. We have Ellen Kenner here, who is a psychologist. And we have myself, uh, Shoshana Milgram, and I'm a, I teach literature at Virginia Tech. And actually, we, we, are, we are all PhDs. But um, for, for today, we don't have to tell you that there's a doctor in the house. <laughs> So uh, today our mission, which we've chosen to accept, is to look at the first villain we meet in the novel, and that's James Taggart. And I think, uh, Ellen Kenner, you'll ask us some questions. All right. Yes, I'll ask some questions. First, I want to start with the description of James, James Taggart that Ayn Rand gives us. His eyes, his eyes are pale and veiled. Let me just pull this up so I don't look over there. Pale and veiled, a glance that moves slowly, never quite stopping, sliding off and past things, in eternal resentment of their existence, obstinate and drained. He had a small, petulant mouth, a posture of limp and, de uh, limp and decentralized sloppiness, in defiance of his tall, slender body, a line of elegance intended for the confident poise of an aristocrat, the flesh of his face was pale and soft, and his head was drawn into his shoulders. And we, we first hear James Taggart when he says, don't bother me, don't bother me, don't bother me. So um, Andy, if you want to go first and describe um, what stands out for you as our starting point for James Taggart. Oh, thank you, Dr. Kenner. Um, what what's, 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 uh, strikes me about James Taggart that I that I really like is I think he is one of the great villains in world literature. And I think I think Ayn Rand and and I got to say the sex scene with Lillian Reardon is so great. <laughs> it's it's a scene. I mean it's so vile. I know only Ayn Rand, you know, only it's great in the, in the sense that's magnificently done. You, know, you have to appreciate it literarily. Only Ayn Rand could have written that, that developed those characters and written, and written that scene where, where, where the scene is dominated by somebody who's not even there, and that's Hank Reardon. Um, but, but, but anyhow, Jim Taggart is a magnificent villain. And I think here's a good essay to be written. I'm going to have to do this one day in my copious spare time. Um, Ayn Rand's analysis of, of the nature of evil with Ellsworth Toohey in The Fountainhead and, and Jim Taggart in Atlas Shrugged, because I think the two of them cover the waterfront uh, on, on, on evil. James Tag, I mean, Ellsworth Toohey in the, in the Fountainhead is a highly stylized character. He's like, he's the essence of an altruist collectivist philosophy stripped of all the psychological defense mechanisms that somebody that evil would you know would, would would in real life would would have and, and would, would need to have in in, in order to survive because Tui is aware of his own evil and I don't think anybody I don't think anybody could could survive uh, being aware that that they were hopelessly irredeemably evil but I but Ayn Rand's focus in Tui's character on the on the the moral philosophy of evil and she dramatizes it brilliantly in, in Tui's character. In Jim Taggart's character in Atlas Shrugged, she's focused on the psychology of evil, the defense mechanisms, the endless lying, the rationalizations that it has to go through, uh, the, the, the copious uh, evasions until reality. And, and, and at the end, I mean, Ayn Rand is showing us something that's, that's really interesting and, and really important. And that is, you know, as a principle of the objectivist metaphysics, to be is to be finite. There's, uh, you know, Aristotle pointed out a long time ago, the infinite exists only in, as a potential, you know, like, the, like the, the natural number series. You can go one zillion, one million and one, one zillion, one million and two, and never come to an end. But in actuality, in terms of everything that exists, it's bounded, it's circumscribed, it is what it is, and it's finite. And even the capacity for evasion is finite. Reality can be so massive at some point that it impinges on the defenses and just crushes them. And that's what happens to Jim Taggart at the end when he realizes mm -hmm. that he, he, he wants John Gall to die, even if it means that his own death is gonna follow six weeks or six months down the road because of Gall's death, he still wants to kill John Gall. 
and he realizes that's been his whole life. He, he's been about nothing but destruction, nothing but killing. He's a complete, total, and consistent nihilist. That is, it's all, he's motivated by the destruction of values. And Ayn Rand shows us, even in little things, you know, like on his birthday, when they were in, in their youth and he got a motorboat and he, you know, understandably, he didn't know how to operate it. And his friend, Cisco, who said there was a few years ago, they never, probably never operated a motorboat himself. I'll show you how to do it, he jumps in. And of course he's an expert. Uh, you know, he's, he's Francisco, Dan Coney, everybody else, every healthy person just, oh my God, this kid's unbelievable. Look at him, you know, it's like, well, I gotta salute you. Whereas Jim Taggart's face is contorted with evil. He hates him, he hates him. Jim could have said, Oh, that's great, Francisco. Show me how you're doing it. You know, he could have had a very different response. He didn't. Right. And, and there's Ayn Rand showing us the essence of, of Jim, uh, of Jim Tag, uh, hatred of values, hatred of the good for being the good, the hatred of those who, who uh, can, can succeed in reality and, and build things up and make life possible. And I don't want to. I don't want to go on because I know Shoshana's got a lot of things to say. But uh, uh, I definitely want to. You'll you know, apply this to his his motives for marrying Cheryl and what he's what he's okay. getting out of it, what he's getting out of this. And and when Ayn Rand is showing us uh, uh, about about his character, but also about how it relates to her philosophy. So, yeah. so I know. Um, yeah, no, well, I, I agree with everything Andy said. And uh, James Taggart is very striking and he's actually believable because, you know, we, we follow his mind as he tries to make it not work. I mean, he starts out by saying, don't bother me, don't bother me. Reality is a threat to him. He doesn't, no reality allowed here. And any of the, th any no people who are on- zone. It's a no reality that's right. zone. That's right. Like, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. Anti-effort too. Anti-effort. Anti-effort. Anti and any people who are on good terms with reality, they're on the other team and he's not interested in them. You know, the, uh, he hates his sister. And I think, by the way, that's one, I mean, you, you can kind of take it for granted, but it's one thing that we actually see within the novel is how different Hank Reardon is from his brother and how different, uh, James Taggart is from his sister, meaning that, you know, obviously it, uh, the apple can sometimes fall pretty far from the tree. Uh, and he hates Dagny. It's as if, you know, she's, which, which means that his life has been pretty bad growing up with someone who represents his nightmare. She's everything that he isn't. And for him, the most fun thing in the world is tearing down people who are on good terms with reality, which incidentally, you know, gets us into into Cheryl Junior League, um, right. but uh, boy, does he hate Hank Reardon? He hates Ellis Wyatt. He hates Dagny. He is thrilled to think that he's going to make one of um, uh, one of his these people whom he hates uncomfortable. You know, putting the skids under my sister is going to make it a good day. He tells Cheryl he wants to break spines. In other words, you know, he knows how to destroy. But of course, as you're saying all along, he's destroyed himself because oh, I, he, he's made himself on bad terms with life, which means that um, when he destroys other people, it's not as if he gets anything out of it. His life doesn't get any, really, in reality, any better. And so, right. you know, from, he's yeah. a loser. At one, point, at one point, he talks about, uh, this is when he's about to resign from the railroad because they've had the tunnel disaster and he's got his letter of resignation by the way that he doesn't sign because he's non-committal you know but i didn't sign it yet yeah. and then he experiences a duty terror that's what ayn rand calls it a duty terror and under it the sneaking hope swift and furtive like a cockroach he would not be president of it any longer taggart transcontinental but neither would anyone else and he repeats that, neither would anyone else. That's his thought. So it's the self content you know, his inner world, I would never want to spend a second in his inner world, but we do. Um, Andy, you mentioned the defenses, and I was starting to make a list of all of his defenses. So I'll list them, and then you both can take off and take it in whatever direction you want. Well, that's your field, Dr. Kenner. <laughs> Um, but obviously he wants to impress people. He doesn't want it real, but he wants the impression. He even wants the, the public opinion of the world matters to him with this Mexican 
village depot, you know, the San Sebastian lines. He has this marble depot with mirrors in this dirt town. You know, he just, he, 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 and, um, he goes to school and he discovers the moral weapon that he can use against any good person, which is the altruism and the collectivism. Um, and so these are some of his excuses. Uh, other railroad companies run at a deficit, so we can too. Uh, this is a national condition. We're not to blame. You hear that over and over. Unforeseen circumstances. And the sarcasm, the Phoenix Durango, it's a local milk line. Um, there are more important things than making money. You know, he's always got this human element. He's always got these friendships, these alleged friendships, but God, I'd never want to be his friend. Um, Ellsworth, you know, Ellis Wyatt, I got a, went into the wrong book, Andy. <laughs> and, and, um, Ellis Wyatt, he dislocated the economy of the whole country by building up Colorado. Reared in metal, but nobody's ever used it before. With Dagny, you've never had any feelings. You've never felt anything at all. And then he's got this disunity as the cause of all social problems. And the final one, his altruist camouflage, which I mentioned, you have um, no sense of the human element. So he uses those over and over and over again. I'm not to blame, um, you know, running from responsibility. So your thoughts on those, or you can take it in whatever direction you want. Well, he's got excuses in the human realm too. I mean, you, you know, you mentioned Cheryl and he's full of excuses with Cheryl and ways in which he can tear her down. And he, who's completely dishonest, um, you know, accuses her of being manipulative you know, right. of, of, of using him, he who uses anybody else for anything that he can't even get any use of. Um, I think that we, you're right in saying that he's always trying to find a way to make himself not responsible for things for which he is responsible. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of that is he tries to take credit for things that he shouldn't get credit for. Mm -hmm. And he's, he, he's done this so long that it's almost become automatic for him. And so when he finds out the news about uh, the, the, um, the San Sebastian line and the, you know, the mines, uh, and so for a minute there, he's thinking it's a, dis it's a dis you know, it's a, is it a disaster, is it good news? And he says, no, no, he's gonna take credit for it, for what Dagny did of removing um, you know, all useful things from that line as if that was his idea all along, when in fact it was his plan to blame her for it. So. He's not exactly, he certainly isn't smart in the sense of being productive, but he certainly is um, experienced in the art of avoiding responsibility and of creating uh, a camouflage of words mm -hmm. to conceal from himself and from anybody else um, the uncomfortable reality that he's no good. Yeah, and that's you know, an important he, he, point he, to yeah, he's himself. no himself. Yeah. He's no, he's no, he's not skilled and he's not morally good. And yet, you know, waking up in the morning and facing that about himself is what he spends all day trying to avoid. Uh, and you mentioned the sex, sexual scene with, uh, with Lillian Reardon. The psychological insight we have there is he thinks horribly, at last, he is himself. Right. <laughs> he is himself. This is his real self. This, this is the real uh, James Taggart. And that's, well, you know, they're doing something that he would never confess to anybody, and yet um, he's doing it for himself. And what what kind of admission is this about? Well, what he wants in life, what his motivation is. Yeah, it's, it's all about trying to hurt Hank Reardon. That's that's yeah. his whole his whole motivation. Mrs. Reardon. Those are the only yeah. words spoken in that whole you know in that, that whole sex scene, uh, which yeah. he said was contemptuously. Um, but yeah, you know, you guys are reminding me. Uh, and, and remember before that, when he saw Lillian with the, he, he, he noticed the safety pin yeah. and he thought, oh yeah, yeah, she's slipping. He's, he's you know, happy like, not. Because yeah. she, she was always so elegant and now she's slipping. That makes him happy that somebody's, somebody's going towards destruction. It is yeah. a sick guy. Ayn Rand's analysis of evil, Shauna, Ellen, everybody, it, it's, almost, it's unbelievably deep here. You know, and, and like the literary world had, you, know, you know, the philosopher is a starting to you know, study objectivism. You know, I don't know, in the literary world, I don't think they really even be 
begin to, you would know better than I, Shoshana, but it seems to me they don't even begin to generally to, to understand the literary genius of Ayn Rand and, and the analysis of evil in, in, in Jim Taggart, it's so deep. You know, I mean, he hates reality because it will not exceed to his whims. If, if, if you know, he, he has that primacy of consciousness desire that, that reality could just, you know, yield to whatever, whatever he desires. It doesn't yield to his whims, but there's not a thing he could do about it. Reality is impervious to any attempts to destroy it. He can't have any effect on the laws of reality. And so he moves from there to hatred of the people who can deal effectively with reality. He hates Francisco, like you said, he hates Dagny, he hates Reardon, he, he hates, comes to hate Gault, but he can't affect them either. They're too big, they're too smart, they're too strong, they're too tough, he can't, he doesn't have any impact on them. It's like Lillian says to him during, you know, in that, in, in, in that sex scene where Jim says, he, Lillian says, he doesn't, Reardon doesn't, Hank Reardon doesn't even notice you. He thinks life is too short to notice you. And Taggart says, he'd notice me if I bashed him over there with a club. And Lillian says, no, nah, I think he'd blame himself for not getting out of the way. Still, that's your only chance, you know? And so he has sex with, with Reardon's wife in an attempt to hurt, to hurt Hank Reardon. He can't affect the heroes. He can't affect the giants, the people who can deal with reality. But who can he affect? Who can he hurt? He can hurt the innocent hero worshippers. He can hurt the Cheryl Brooks. He can the people, hurt Cheryl. The people, yeah, the people who look up to the heroes. He can hurt them. He can wound them. He can disfigure them. In the end, he can kill them. And he kills Cheryl Brooks as a stand-in for the heroes that he can't harm, who are themselves a stand-in for the reality that are, that's impervious to his to his desires. And Ayn Rand's analysis here is just, I mean, it's just, it's extraordinary. You know, it's absolutely, it's absolutely great. He uses Cheryl so much. He taunts her, he plays with her, he buys her a bracelet. I mean, we have Hank getting the bracelet that Dagny ends up with, the, the chain, um, rather than Lillian, and the diamond bracelet. But Cheryl's bracelet that he buys her in the pendant, she wears with a dress and she goes to an event and it's totally inappropriate. And she's trying so hard to be moral and to, I mean, she is moral through and through, but to learn, and she's got courage to speak up. We're not talking about Cheryl here, though. but he just looks for opportunities to tear her down with bitter sarcasm, uh, with even the way he asked her to get married. You know, she's feeling mortified. And then he says, will you marry me on the stoop of her tenement house with yeah. Well, um, yeah. Yes. Well, well, you see, she, yeah, I mean, I think that she's got a real, she has a reality orientation. And one of the things that I think we see with Taggart, and this is only part of what goes wrong with the relationship with Cheryl, is that he keeps changing the rules. And that's confusing to her. And actually, it shows up with Cheryl, you know, not being able to tell the red light from the green light. And when you live with James Taggart, you can't tell the red light from the green light because he prefers to live in a world without rules, without principles. And, no, absolutely. You know, yeah, just on the base of whims. He wants to be head of Taggart Transcontinental without doing any of the things that you would have to do to be head of tra Taggart Transcontinental. So he's all sort of. Well, that's part of what, what it is when we've got fiction, is we've got perfect examples of that sort of uh, being an enemy of reality, which is what he is. When we talked about um, Eddie Willers, it was like, if, if he came into my office, what one gift would I want to give him? And it would be to learn how to introspect. And Andy, you talked about you're wanting him to broaden his scope of living a little more, maybe have a romance or, you mm -hmm. know, a hobby or something, um, and we know he loves the railroad. If James Taggart came into my office, what would I do? I have had the experience in Veterans Hospital of working on a locked ward with abuse, um, people who are very abusive to their children or, uh, um, or others or, or their wives or partners. Or, and it, it is fascinating. They are completely like James Taggart. They are evasive. If you try to name any fact, yes, but what about the rails? What about the rails? You know, how we, what about Orrin Boyle when he's not delivering? They, 
shift off topic. And at the time I was studying Leonard Peikoff's logic course and learning about the, the different logical fallacies, 10 or 12 that he goes through. And I was sitting there going, okay, now it's argument, you know, he would say, well, you're just a shrink. They, they would yell at me because I'm supposed to evaluate these people to see if they um, could be let out of their locked wards and go back to the people they've abused. And so I would just say, can you give me evidence that you've changed? And that they would, that was the laser, if you have a circle, that was the laser question. And they would use every single logical fallacy that I had learned, you know, um, attacking my character or using pity, I'll be out on the street. Um, and at the end, when they kind of ran out of things and I kept asking the same question, you know, what, what evidence do you have that you've changed? The, it, I could see the look in their eyes that they were heading towards argumentum ad baculum, like they wanted to kill me. They uh -huh. wanted, you know, take uh -huh. the, and, and that's what I get with James. I get that feeling that he is trapped. He'll use every defense without knowing about Aristotle and logical fallacies. He uses them all. When he discovers in college that moral cover that he can say he's a humanitarian and tear down the, and, and he gets the mind, um, the spiritual, that he's spiritual, not materialistic. He gets that split. He uses them as bludgeons to people. He just, and he wants to see people struggle. He, the emotions he has are all upside down, all inverted. If something good happens, he doesn't feel good. If something bad happens, he'll say, oh, and then he'll go, yeah. <laughs> you know, he, he just, he screwed up his mind. So he's got that inverted, can't even call it a moral code, an incredibly corrupt code of altruism and collectivism. And he, he uses them on every good person he can find, every good you know, art. You know, you, I, I think it's very interesting what you said um, because he was off to a bad start early, but the rationalizations exacerbated um, his, uh, his, his evil. And maybe that fits in with what Andy was saying about the current back uh, when we're talking about A.E. Willers about what some of those executives are like in Target Crunch Continental. They've been to college too and yeah, right. learned some bad things there. You know, so I, I but I, I think that part of what we see with him is that he likes the rationalizations because they help him hide from himself the nature of his own wishes and actions because he doesn't want to think of himself as completely evil. That's, of course, what happens to him in the end. No, you know, that's not true. And he surrounds and, himself with friends who see the world the same way he does, but they, because he's a slime ball, he assumes they all are, and they are all slime balls. So the friendship is not everything. I mean, he talks about how mm -hmm. important friends are to Paul Larkin, and you know, it comes up other times in the book. But that is anything but friendship. That's just cunning and uh, using people, being highly manipulative. Yeah, and he's yeah. a highly like like Tui in the Fountain, and and, I, and like I said, I see the two of them. Uh, jointly as, as Ayn Rand's study in the nature of evil. And they're, they're highly stylized characters in, in different, you know, in, in, in different ways, or some ways the same way. But um, yeah, you're right, I'm, what you said, Ellen. Taggart literally is, is never shown. I don't, I don't remember a single scene in, in which he appears in which he's, he's positive or, or benign or in pursuit of values. You know, uh, it's always about, destruction, it's always about tearing things down rather than building them up. It's always about undermining, you know, the heroes who, who make life possible. It's, it's, he's, he's completely nihilistic. It's, you know, he has a yeah. big word, right? Meaning, meaning uh, his motivation is to destroy, not to, not to create, to destroy values, not to, not to, to, to de destruction rather than construction, you know, and then making human life impossible rather than possible. Ayn Rand's very consistent in the way she, she shows. You know, in real life, Jim Taggart might, you know, adopt a stray puppy, you know, Hitler maybe, Hitler maybe gave money to charities, you know, or maybe, maybe he was kind to his, uh, his girlfriend, wife, Ava Braun at times, you know, it, 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 in real life, 
that's 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 probably the case. But Ayn Rand's point here is, given that magnitude of evil, you know, using Hitler as an example, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter if he had kind moments to his wife or he adopted a stray puppy or everything. It's, it's, it's irrelevant to the essence of who he is. And so Ayn Rand just eliminates the irrelevancies. It doesn't show any of that. It's just everything about Tag is consistently nihilistic and destructive. But that's also camouflage. I mean, if you, if you get a puppy, that's another defense mechanism. You're trying to show yourself you're kind to a puppy when you're killing everybody around you or you know, attempting to kill them. So I think that um, that in itself can't even be looked at as something benevolent. It's just trying to fake to yourself, I'm good to people. What do you mean? I'm good to the dog. I'm good to my wife occasionally. And, so, um, yeah. and they, they don't change. I, I didn't finish my example. I just yeah. thought that, um, and then I'll jump to you, Shoshana. Um, but with if he came into my office, he would be one of the people that would not want to face himself. On very rare occasions, I, a lot of my clients read Atlas Shrugged um, because I mentioned it and I brought it up. Um, and I remember an honest one who was not a very nice person came in and said, oh my God, I see myself in this. And I, I hate to say that, but I can see why my wife is uncomfortable with me and I need to change, help me. That is honest, but that is incredibly rare. Um, so I, I think that uh, I think that James, once he said his premises, he was had he wasn't an introspector. He used emotions as a bludgeon. He snaps at people. He yells at them. He when he goes out to eat with his buddies on a small table up in the bar, there are four of them, and he takes the whole. You know, it's a small table. But he takes the table and he has all of this confidence, but that confidence is like a puff ball. It goes, poof, the minute he gets with the Dagny or an Eddie. Uh, go ahead, Shoshana. Yeah, no, it's just I was I was sort of playing devil's advocate here, or James Taggart's advocate, and when, when Andy was saying, which is correct, that he's got no values, he's nihilistic and so on. And I thought, well, what would he say? And he'd say, Well, you know, I'm I'm good at business. I'm but the thing is everything that he's doing in business is destructive. And that's why the scene that I think you call it the deal, you know, with the, with the people at the table and- Oh know, yeah, yeah, with yeah, yeah I, I think Andy calls it the deal. And, um, it, but the things, their deal is not like what's properly trade, you know, right. what the business people do. They're, you could use the word trade, but there aren't, it isn't trade. It's all, it's all destructive. It's all, you know, right. bringing, bringing, bringing people down, controlling people and getting quote advantages that are short unquote, which are short range. And yeah, he, he doesn't actually know anything about anything, which is one reason why he can't tolerate that anybody else could know anything about anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he. Right. The deal, I mean, they're trading political favors yeah. in order to destroy each other's enemies, right? Put Dan Conway yeah. out of business, you know, so on. It's all, it's all about destruction. I mean, you're right. This is, yeah. I get, Ayn Rand is very consistent in her portrayal of him and his cronies. He didn't have friends. He didn't quote, can't quote yeah. one of his friends, he's a crony, you know? Right. Yeah, that's funny, isn't it? Because he, you know, he's, he uses that language, but um, his, they're all bad. I mean, you could say that's the one thing they have in common is that they're all destructive. He doesn't have any virtuous friends. Yeah, and Ayn Rand really making a comment here on, you know, on what's known as crony capitalism. And- uh, Ooh, I, I, Crony socialism, I try never to put yeah. those two words. Yeah, I, but that's the popular yeah. usage is, cro uh, is crony capitalism. Cronyism. The point of course is it's a, it's a mixed economy and, and the government in the, the socialist element of the mixture the, the government officials have the power to buy and sell political favors or economic favors. And so there are businessmen like Jim Taggart who kiss up to the government to, you know, to get government force you know, to, to, against their competitors or, you know, or, or whatever, to, to, you know, government force coercion to, to help their business at the, at the expense of, of the customers or their competitors or, or whatever. So yeah, it's not it's not capitalism, but it's cronyism or crony socialism. And and Ayn Rand, uh, Ayn Rand here making a you know a commentary on this. She dead set against it. 
She's dead set against somebody getting, I won't say making money, but somebody getting money or stealing money by use of, you know, by kissing up the government bureaucrats, making, you know, the, uh, dishonest exchanges or trades with government regulators or bureaucrats or politicians to get to get government favor to coerce against the Phoenix Durango or whatever, put their competitors out of business or when, you know, whatever, undermine their competitors in, in some way. Ayn Rand's dead set against it. She's very clear that she believes in a free market, a strict separation of state and economy, just like you have a separation of state and church and people who make a pay, make a lot of money then, you know, in, 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 in on, a, on a basically free market, they, they've earned it. Andrew Carnegie, you know, a good example, uh, John D. Rockefeller, the so-called robber barons who are actually productive geniuses, they earn their wealth by creating enormous value, by creating, you know, enormous amount of high quality steel or high quality petroleum products. So she's absolutely against, you know, cronyism and, you know, and for a free market, uh, you know, and a set, strict legal separation of state and economy. And Jim Taggart and Oren Boyle, these guys, Taggart especially, they're perfect examples of her condemnation of cronyism. And right. so, and you know. Uh, you didn't bill that from Obama. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, good, good. And everybody has, everybody has some inputs and nobody, it, it, um, QED. Therefore, we can't be. Yeah, well, in Taggart, James Taggart's case, Obama would be right. James Taggart didn't build it. But in Nathaniel Taggart's case, uh, Obama's uh, claim would be false. Nathaniel Taggart did build it. Yeah, exactly. and James and James Taggart would have thrown it away if Dagny hadn't been around to hold it together. Right. I mean, I think that that's actually a good example of how those robber barons, um, in in reality, and and here in in the fictional example, can't actually create a productive dynasty unless there are productive people to carry mm -hmm. to carry it on. And um, in the novel, Dagny's father says there'll always be a taggart to run the railroad, but he doesn't mean he doesn't mean James. And yeah, um, railroad road workers know that too. They they look at Dag. They they know the facts. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. And, and, it's a small it's a small point in the story, Shoshana. But you're right. That's a good point. Their father recognized that that she would be the one to the, his daughter, not his son. Right. Be the one right. to carry on the, the the family work. Yeah, that's right. He did. Yeah, and so basically, he doesn't have the excuse of saying nobody ever gave him a chance. You know, he had a chance. He had a chance. It's it's just himself. He, was, he doesn't he have it. He throws away his chances. He gets in his he gets in his own way because he's not on the side of reality and is against those who are. And he's um, so no. anti-corporate. What Ayn Rand contrasts Dagny going off to the Berkshire, the Woodstock Berkshires, with James Taggart leaving and going to the his father's mansion or something. And James is there, you know. Drinking, pretending he's sick, cold, right? Pretending he's sick. I had a cold. Dagny shingling the roofs, building paths, planning rail railways that can go there, and just the contrast there. It, you, he's so anti effort. He's so anti thought. He's so anti life. Yeah, and he. I mean, you're right, Shoshan, because I've never had a chance. This is the guy who par excellence had a chance. He was born into an enormously successful family that had, you know, he, he went to top schools uh, and even his genetics. Uh, at one point in the description, then Ayn Rand uh, doesn't yeah. describe him as, as being, as being, he's tall, you know, but, but mm -hmm. he, he kind of like slouches over as if in defiance of his own, of his own height, you know, as if he wanted to attack reality, even there in terms that it, yes. it gave him, it gave him a certain, a certain stature. Because he has all these advantages, and 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 your point you're making, Alan, about the you know the the physical productivity, the, the construction work. Well, Dagny is a, is a very attractive woman. I mean, was she what is she? She's five four, let's say, weighs I don't know 115 pounds, let's say. Well, he's a big guy. He's six foot. He's over, you know, he's tall. He's six foot. He's six one. Whatever you know, whatever he weighs, 180 pounds. I mean, you know, that gives him a physical a physicality potentially to do all kinds of you know constructive work. But that's that's not who he is. That's about building. He doesn't want to build. He had to have Dagny build it so he could tear it down. And the guy is a—he's just—he's really he is a, he is a he is a horror. He is an absolute horror. Yeah, I think even just uh, the the way that in the description that Ellen read us, he's described as looking older than he is. That's right, right. You know, it's it's as if, well. The age it's not it, it's, going through adolescence. That's the way I know. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not as if he looks older because he's been so busy working hard. It's because running against reality uh, also kind of 
seems to tinker with the clock. And um, he's he's kind of someone who, who, well, first she tells you how old he looks. And then at the end, she tells you how old he is. And I think that, um, well, as you say, you know, Daphne's quite different. And she's described as, sometimes she's described as being a girl, which I don't think is condescending, but implies, you know, that she has a kind of energy and vitality and grace and um, she can do whatever she wants. Yeah. You know, with her, I think that's right. That's what her, her, her body can, you know, is at her service. And with him, he's not using his mind. He's not using his body. He's not using the chances that came with his inheritance. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Um, I want to jump back to sex for a minute. Yeah, just let me, and let me interrupt you for okay. a second, Ellen. Just, and, and just an, another a choice that the two of them make. They both go to college, presumably a good college. Dagny chooses to major in engineering, and Jim chooses to major in public relations. Now, you know, he, he could have, that's not the most productive field. I mean, it can be productive in, in the hands of rational persons, but you know, somebody, does somebody run a railroad? If he wants to be the president of the railroad, is that the best, is that the best field for somebody who wants to run a railroad? Uh, yeah, yeah I, wouldn't, I wouldn't think so. I would think that, I would think that, you know, some other, other business related courses, uh, at least at their best would be much more, you know, management. You probably find some, some schools of management that, that, that are good, that where, you, where there's real lessons, you know, if you want to run a major business. Uh, like Tiger Transcontinental, public relations, uh, not, not the best choice, but it's but it suits Jim Tiger because he's not about, uh, just like with Cheryl, he's not about being that guy. He's about being perceived mm -hmm. as that guy. He's Peter Keating in that, in, in that, in that way. He, he doesn't care about the reality. He doesn't want to be productive. He wants to be perceived as productive. So it's more like how to win friends and influence people in a negative sense rather mm -hmm. than how to communicate well. And yeah, I don't think Dale Carnegie that. would, I don't think Dale Carnegie would approve of Jim Taggart's methods, but we get, we, but we no. get your point. Ellen. Yeah, it's just, it's just, if his goal is destruction and he wants to go to Washington and he wants power, he wants to crush good people, then he needs to know how, how they might it. work and how to public relations, how to, um, control them and then he gets the weapon of course which we've mentioned yeah, he, 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 no absolutely absolutely right he needs how to how to how to convey the image yes. that's necessary to you know to to be able to to mask the image that will mask his true destructive urges so yeah pr is is the right field for a guy like him and we want to be clear pr is a legitimate field for people who want to like do honest you know, advertising and, and stuff, but for Taggart, it's it's PR in order to cover, get to convey the right right image to cover his his true motives and let him go on, you know, uh, destroying, con continuously destroying. You know, it's but interesting. He he needs Dagny to make it work, because if he didn't have Dagny around, everything would fall apart. Mm -hmm. And you might think that since he needs Dagny to make it work, that he would treat her with respect. Oh, it's a that there would be a please or a thank you. No, but you see, the thing is that he knows that she doesn't care, um, that it the, that she's not waiting around for his please or thank you, and that she's going to do it because she loves it. So I think that's kind of interesting. If he thought that he had to scare her into working, then he would do that. And he even sort of sends up little trials in which he tries to insult her and so on, because, of course, that's fun for him. Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's, there's times, and if he doesn't you know, too much, is she going to quit? Is she going to rebel? But she just ignores him. Right. There's times, Shoshana, you know, where he, where he's desperate and he, he says to her, Dagny, I'm your brother. You know, I want to be president of the railroad. In other words, you're the one who can make it happen. Now, all, now I've been trying to destroy you all along, never, but never mind that. You're the one who can make it happen. I want to be the president of the railroad. You can see the whim worship here. I don't want to actually do the work of being a, you know, an effective president of the railroad. I don't want to stop undermining your efforts to be productive either. But I want to be the president of a railroad. I just want reality to snap into, into line in, in accordance with my whims, even though I'm either not taking the steps to be productive or I'm taking the steps to make sure that you can't be productive. I mean, the guy is, oh, yeah, he really is. Yeah. He, he's fascinating. Well, fascinating. What, you were, what you were just saying kind of reminded me of uh, Reardon's brother, yeah. who sends his mother. He wants yeah. a job. Yeah, right. 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 But, you know, yeah. he, he wants it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the double standard is very common. If you look at people who are on welfare, I mean, you might I have 
I did have one person as a client who wanted to get off of welfare and they were very, they were great. Um, and they read Atlas Shrugged. <laughs> but um, said, uh, I think that they people, if they're on welfare, like Jim is in a sense, he's, he's, uh, he's using Dagny, he's feeding off of her brain, her energy, her productiveness, her knowledge, her ambition, her love, a love of her life. Um, he, he bites the, he, that phrase, you bite the hand that feeds you. That's what I see him doing. He hates her because he's dependent on her. Mm -hmm. And he, on some level, doesn't want to recognize it. You know, that's why he's got all these defense mechanisms. But um, so that's why he doesn't nourish her. He doesn't thank her. He's going to bite the hand that feeds him. Yeah. And um, he's, so, and he's so stupid about it. Um, he's just so stupid about it. I mean, the, the, the scene from, from the beginning when Dagny's talking to him about, um, about reared metal. I mean, she, she's lived with this guy for many years. And so she knows how he works. And she says, drop it, Jim. I know everything you're going to say. Nobody's ever used it before. Nobody approves of weird and metal. Nobody's interested in it. Nobody wants it. Still, our rails are going to be made of weird and metal. And she's already given him. She knows all of his excuses. And he comes right out. <laughs> and, 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 yeah. And he can't avoid going to the very first one. It's almost as if Dagny could be a better James Taggart than James Taggart could be because she's aware of the way that he thinks. And he can't even stop himself from doing the stupid automatic thing that she's already told him isn't going to work. So you I know. have a question yeah. for Shana. Yeah. Um, sure. And Andy too, I know you did the Cliff Notes for Atlas Shrugged. So I know you know you both know the book, but I wonder in your research, have you come across anything like you did with Eddie Willers? You gave us a little snippet of how Ayn Rand was going to title a book um, long ago, Eddie Willers. Yeah. And any nuggets that you have in your research on Ayn Rand on James Taggart that we might not know about that you'd be willing to share? Well, she had uh, people in, in whom she met in her life whom she didn't like and who said this, you know, did the sort of manipulative things, not necessarily to her, but to other people and that she could draw on that for experience. But um, I don't, no, uh, no. well, yeah. Uh, I think that she, uh, when, when she creates a character, she, you know, she stylizes the character and the character is perfect. And as you were saying, in real life, a person might have other features that wouldn't necessarily make a difference, but would change the portrait. But, right. um, but, but James Tackert, he doesn't have any of the redeeming features, yeah. Yeah. which is actually kind of interesting. So, um, I mean, even to, even to, he had that moment when he wanted to burn the paper. That's right. And that's right. yeah. Andy? No, no, that's right. Uh, that's a good point Shoshana is making because uh, to, it's, it's interesting, Tui, Tui in the Fountainhead is, 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 is honest with himself at times. He recognizes you know, how evil he is, he even tells a police officer, you should arrest me, you know, uh, yeah. officer, which, you know, which, is, which is true. Uh, so so the Tui's more honest, but he's psychologically unrealistic. Nobody that evil could be that honest with was Taggart's dishonest, but he's psychologically realistic. He had that, that kind of evil. You'd have to uh, be that evasive. I remember, you know, many years ago in the, in the late 1970s, Leonard Peikoff, uh, Dr. Peikoff was living in New York city. He was lecturing, you know, at the, at the old Statler Hilton on, on seventh Avenue. And I, I said, uh, I run out of grad school after like classes to go hear Leonard lecture. And he was writing the ominous parallels at that time. So the Nazis were on his mind and, I remember him, him saying once, and I think it was in a Q and A, he said something, you know, like if somebody is as evil as Hitler, you know, they, you know, you, you, you can't acknowledge that to yourself. You would either, you would either go out of your mind or you'd commit suicide. Right. And, and Hitler did both, as, as Leonard, Leonard pointed out. Now Jim Taggart goes out of his mind when he when he realizes you know, his, his what his you know uh, reality just crushes through his the the walls of of evasion. Uh, you know, and, and just impinges or, or blasts itself uh, up, upon him. And I think, you know, and that's that I think is what would what, what, what ha what necessarily have happened to Tui, you know, for, what, for somebody being that honest. But again, Ayn Rand's not, 
in her in her portrayal of evil with Tui in the Fountainhead. She's not uh, she's not showing us the psychologically realistic version uh, of, of evil. She's showing us the, the moral philosophy of evil, distilled the distilled essence of the of the moral philosophy of, of evil in, in Tui's characters. That's a fascinating. They, the two of them uh, in concert make a fascinating study. In the, in the nature of you. I got to write an essay on this on this one day. It's too important. So I had two things to bring up. One is going back to the sex scene. I apologize. Uh, but this is the early sex scene with Betty Pope. And this mm -hmm. struck me the time this time when I read it. He said, you look like a snail. And I'm not going to go through the whole dialogue. She was wearing, what do you remember that she was wearing? A, a Harlequin purple and yellow outfit. And he's um, a negligee. Isn't, and you sure you sure he isn't the one who looks like a snail? Oh, I thought it was him saying it to her. It doesn't matter. They're both exchanging. You can check it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think I think she says it to, to him. I, I, oh, I, she yeah. says it to him. She wants to clip her toenails or something. Um, but they said it's a you. This is that's not the main point. The uniform. This is the uniform they wore oh, on, yeah. special, on certain occasions. And it's worn dutifully for a specified purpose and then discarded. The nature of their relationships had the same quality in it. There was no passion in it, no desire, no actual pleasure, not even a sense, a sense of shame. The act of sex was neither a joy or a sin. It meant nothing. They had heard that men and women were supposed to sleep together, so they did. But that idea of his relationship with people is all this phoniness. They go through the motions yeah. of imitating productive, healthy, happy people. Uh, but they know that they're a fraud inside. It doesn't do anything for them. It's yeah, you're right. It's, co it's completely valueless. Right, There's right. There's no value in their, re in their relationship. Yeah. It's, not, it's not even casual. But even oh. a casual relationship amongst relatively healthy people so they're not deeply in love with each other but they care about each other you know there's a, there's a certain caring and then there's an affection and they and they do things for each, for for each other there's there's a value in you know in, a, in it there's none of that here there's no there's no affection there's no there's no caring or sharing or doing anything for each other right she's, not very, she's not very nice to cheryl either yeah, there's when Cheryl you know, becomes part of his life, uh, Betty, Betty right. Pope misbehaves. Yeah, she's cruel. So the, other, yeah. the other point that, and we can each end on something. I love the sob sister, the warning oh. that mm -hmm. gives to Cheryl that uh, at her wedding, that uh, there are people I, when you you might discover. I don't have the exact quote that there are people who want to hurt you because of the good they see in you. Don't let them do it. Right. You know? Yeah. That's very insightful. So yeah, it yeah. just I mean I and then, she, and, and then know, she gives she gives she gives her a ride to the wedding. I think she should drive her out of town. <laughs> you know, she, she should even, save her. Give her Atlas shrugs. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, I think of the takeaways for this. Um, if we want to sum up, do you have do any do either of you have something you want to say before we start summing up? Anyway. Well, you know, the, the, the ending and the beginning go together, you know, don't bother me. I have no interest in reality. And then in the end, reality comes crashing down on him. And it's the worst thing that he could ever learn. And there's no way to go beyond it. So yeah. his story also, no, sir. Yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good wrap up, Shoshana. Reminds me uh, that famous line from Tolstoy. You know that you may have no interest in evil, but evil has an interest in you. <laughs> mm. I, I've always paraphrased that. You know that you may have no interest in politicians, but politicians have an interest in you. But is it, but with Taggart, yeah, that's a good point because Taggart has no interest in reality, but reality has an interest in him in effect and avenges itself upon Taggart. Yes. Taggart's willful rejection and denial of reality in the end, and and so Ayn Rand showing us that. Volition gives us the capacity to, to deny reality in a number of forms, but it doesn't give us the capa capacity to, to uh, escape the consequences, uh, you know, of, of that denial. Yes. Like today, like today a, a homey example, down home example would be, we know the consequences today of, of heavy smoking. Somebody who just repudiates that smokes three packs, you know, of, of, of cigarettes every, every day. Well, you know, you, you're free to do that, but you, you, you're not free to escape the, the damage to your heart and lungs from, from that. 
So we could sum up or give your takeaways uh, from, I mean, what, what are the takeaways for you personally about the character of James Taggart? Oh, I would just say, to, to wrap it up, the, the, the nihilism that Ayn Rand demonstrates here uh, is a fascinating, fascinating study of the nature of evil. Look at some of the bad guys in great literature, you know, Iago in, in Othello and, you know, and, you know and, and characters like that. And I think elsewhere too in The Fountainhead and James Taggart in, in, in Atlas Shrugged, a, a, a much deeper, you know, and, and much more uh, profound analysis of the, of the nature of evil. Not to take anything away from the bard, you know, who's a uh, magnificent writer, but Ayn Rand's insights into philosophy and, and, and you know, evil is moral philosophy. Ayn Rand's right. insights into philosophy are deeper and more profound than any literary figure in history. That's, the, you know, that, that's, that's my takeaway from it. Yeah, Shoshana? Well, you know, he's, he's, he keeps showing up in the book and interestingly, he's always on the wrong side and anyone he dislikes, you know, actively dislikes is probably going to be a good person because he hates the good in the good people. Okay, now now other people might sort of be in his way, but any anybody whom he dislikes and disdains, you know, when Ellis Wyatt, he's, you know, he hates Ellis Wyatt, okay. Uh, he's one of the good guys, hates Reardon, one of the good guys. Hates Eddie Willers, okay. You know, it, it's almost as if that's like a diploma for Eddie Willers before we've even seen that much of Eddie Willers that um, he can't, that. James Taggart, we see how he is. So, yeah, he's um, he's a hater. Yeah, you know, he's he's a hater. He's a hater of life. He's a hater of the good. He's the anti-life, yeah. and that's an important principle in the book. So my takeaways are, um, yeah, he's he's so evil. <laughs> uh, my takeaways are that, and again, it's a gift that Ayn Rand gives us that we can be on the lookout for all of these little psychological defense mechanisms in first in ourselves. We want to clean up, clean house if we have any from old baggage, but this, and that's most important. But the second is when we meet other people, because they're going, to, many times evil people try to fake good and many times they can fool you, uh, such as James with Cheryl. Um, and you, we don't want to be fooled by them. We want to look for, are they shifting the blame? Are they lying? Are they taking credit for other people? Are they always, um, are they sarcastic? What about their emotions? Do they tend to question themselves? Do they tend or to- Or do they, do they tell you, you couldn't understand this? Oh, That's one of his tricks. You could, higher, yeah. It's a higher dimension yeah. or this is the human yeah. element and you don't understand it. So I think that the takeaway is it gives me much, it arms me, it psychologically arms me to go out in the world and make friends and know how to unmake friends too when that's necessary, you know, or to keep an arm's length. Um, you know, I, I, and, and I know we're out of time here. So I just wanted to oh, okay. paraphrase the old biblical expression, you know, <laughs> that he, he that, he that lives by the sword shall die by the sword. Yes. But I think, you know, paraphrase for Jim Taggart, it is he who uh, rejects reality will be, you shall be crushed by the reality he rejects. Mm -hmm. And that, that I think is a, a, an important lesson in, in, in his character. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, well, uh, well, this, was, this was fun, everybody. Thank yeah, you, Dr. Thank Milgram. You. Dr. Got rid of James Taggart. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, the big boss man said, you know, we'll have a chance to come back to his character in the future because we'll all we'll all miss him so much. Okay, as long as we can get Dagny back again and Hank and, and, and others. So yeah. this has been wonderful. And thank Rosie. I, um, thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Rosie, for having us. Thank you, big boss man, Rosie Ginsburg, the grand poobah of the Iron Man Center UK. And thank you, Shoshana. Andy. It's been fun. Yeah, this is fun. And good goodbye to James.